I'm excited to tell you a little bit about my love for oxygen biology, and I hope you will find it equally fascinating. So the title of my talk today is Turning the Oxygen and Vitamin Dials. And so uh, broadly speaking, my lab is absolutely fascinated by trying to understand how organisms interact with the environment. So how is it that we as humans um, interact with our diet and with our atmosphere to affect disease progression and metabolism? And more specifically, we think about this in the context of oxygen and vitamins. So I always like to start with a little bit of history of science to get us inspired uh, about the future of future discoveries in the field. And so these are images of the first so-called oxygen scientists. So people knew for some time that oxygen was an absolutely essential aspect of human health and disease, but it was fairly difficult to actually study the effects of oxygen on human physiology. And the first time this actually became possible was with the invention of hot air balloons. And so hot air balloons were invented. And in the late 1800s, the first aeronauts would actually get into these hot air balloons and ascend to high altitude very rapidly and study the effects on the metabolism and physiology of themselves. Uh, they actually performed these really fascinating experiments where they would take a cage of pigeons on these hot air balloon rides and release them at different heights and observe the pigeons to see how they, how they fared. Were they able to fly at high altitudes? What happened to their heart rate, respiratory rate, et cetera? Um, and so these are some very creative uh, approaches to studying oxygen biology. Turns out they were actually also very dangerous. And so the first aeronauts uh, actually perished. And so this was a flight called the Zenith. They ascended to thousands of feet within a matter of tens of minutes. And of course, uh, at that low oxygen level, um, it's actually toxic telling you again how important oxygen is for human health. Um, luckily, we have it much easier now in the lab. We can study oxygen biology in a much more practical setting um, and uh, answer these questions that really drive uh, human disease in a much more uh, practical manner. So big picture, we are understanding what happens when there's too little or too much oxygen in the body. Uh, we call this the Goldilocks principle of oxygen. And part of the lab is also studying vitamins. So what happens when there's too little or too much of a given vitamin in our diet and how does that affect disease? So the big questions that we're asking is why is too little oxygen toxic? And this is an extremely important question to understand because if we think about the leading causes of death in the US, uh, three of the five of them are actually associated with a lack of oxygen and a lack of nutrients. And so whether it's a heart attack, a stroke, or respiratory failure, in all of those situations, the tissue ultimately succumbs to a lack of oxygen and nutrients. So how can we understand what is going wrong when there's too little oxygen and perhaps uh, design therapies to intervene? And on the opposite side of the coin is something that we find equally fascinating, and this is actually very understudied, um, which is why is too much oxygen toxic? And so typically when we talk about oxygen, most people assume that oxygen is a good thing. And actually there are these oxygen bars all over the country where you can go and recreationally inhale high amounts of oxygen for fun or for a sort of a spa treatment. And what I hope to convince you today is that this might actually be relatively dangerous and perhaps we should be cautious about how much oxygen we breathe, um, especially when we have specific disorders. And so my lab is trying to understand why it is that too much oxygen is toxic. Uh, how does the body sense variations in oxygen levels? Um, does evolution have a way to basically feel how much oxygen is in the atmosphere or in the body and then adapt to cope with these variations in oxygen levels? And this was actually part of the topic of the recent Nobel Prize about a year ago. Um, and I'll mention that pathway a little bit in, in this presentation. Um, and after the body senses oxygen levels, how does it adapt, if at all? And if it can't adapt, how does this lead to disease? And then what are the diseases of too little or too much oxygen? 
Um, and if we identified them, how can we change the amount of oxygen that we're breathing as a therapeutic strategy? And so again, you know, most people think about therapeutics as being small molecules or pills. Um, instead, we like to have a, a little bit of a twist on this concept. And we think about how we can change what we're breathing as a therapeutic strategy. And then we are asking the exact same questions in the context of vitamin biology. How does the body sense variations in vitamin levels? How does it adapt? And how can we use this to develop treatments? And so uh, the story began in a very different sort of realm. And initially I was really interested in mitochondrial biology. And so as you all may recall from um, high school biochemistry or middle school biochemistry, uh, mitochondria are the so-called powerhouses of the cell. They're compartments within the cell, and here there are these pink worm-like structures, and the green here is the nucleus where all of the DNA is housed in the cell. And this is just an image or a video of um, the beautiful dynamics of mitochondria. And so they're the parts of the cell that make energy or ATP, but it turns out they also have many, many other functions in the body. Um, and just to zoom in, you can again see the beautiful structure of these cellular compartments um, that enable the mitochondria to perform all of these different functions. Um, and unfortunately, when things go wrong in the mitochondria, it leads to a range of different disorders. Um, and I like to think about this almost as a spectrum. And so when you have a very severe mitochondrial dysfunction, this leads to these rare inborn errors of metabolism. Um, and these typically affect children um, at a very young age. And the most common type of mitochondrial disease is a disease called Lee syndrome, which I'll talk about today. And while these disorders are rare, they do affect about one in 5,000 live births. So still fairly common for a uh, metabolic disorder. And these children typically don't live past the first few years of life. Um, then we can go to the range of more moderate mitochondrial dysfunction. And this is often associated with age-related conditions. And sort of the classical example is Parkinson's disease. Um, and so many forms of Parkinson's disease uh, are associated with moderate mitochondrial dysfunction. And in that situation, it's thought that it's actually partially causal for the symptoms that the patients have. Um, and then mild mitochondrial dysfunction is actually one of the very well-conserved hallmarks of the aging process. And so as organisms age, whether it's mice or worms or humans, um, we see a progressive loss of mitochondrial functions. And this again is thought to contribute um, to uh, age associated conditions. And so what really drew me to this, this concept of mitochondrial dysfunction is the tremendous potential for biomedical impact. If we could understand what was going wrong and perhaps develop treatments, this could really have a uh, sort of a large impact on the biomedical sphere. And as I mentioned, uh, mitochondrial disease, mitochondria are important for all parts of the body. And so we decided to study the very severe mitochondrial disorders first, thinking that if we could develop a treatment for those conditions, it could likely apply to the more moderate types of mitochondrial dysfunction. And so the severe mitochondrial disorders that affect children uh, predominantly can affect nearly every organ system. And so patients with mitochondrial disease have blindness, deafness, um, muscle issues, neurodegenerative disease, liver failure, nearly every aspect of the physiology of the patient is affected. And unfortunately, at this stage, there really are no therapies that work consistently for these disorders. Um, patients are sort of ad hoc given random supplements um, that don't really work effectively. And so this is really a, a field that is looking for new approaches and therapies. And so this was during my training in the lab of Amsi Muta. Uh, we became really interested in trying to tackle this question using modern methodologies. So can we ask this question in a very unbiased manner? What is the ideal therapeutic target for mitochondrial dysfunction? So which gene in the genome, when perturbed, could cure mitochondrial disease? And ideally, that would then become a drug target. And so I'm making a long story short, but I first approached this question right when CRISPR technology uh, was becoming available. 
And so the overall principle is that you start with this giant pool of cells, so millions and millions of cells, and you create a different gene knockout in each cell. So imagine in this pool, rainbow pool of cells, different cells have a different gene knockout. And then you take this giant pool of cells and subject it to mitochondrial dysfunction or healthy conditions. And you ask in a completely unbiased manner out of all of the genes in the genome, which gene knockout allows you to survive while you are coping with mitochondrial dysfunction. And so it's a very um, sort of unbiased way to tackle the question genome wide um, and come up with very novel uh, therapies. And we performed this experiment, and the answer was completely black and white in this data set. Um, what we found was activating the so-called hypoxia response was protective against mitochondrial dysfunction. And so I'm showing this pathway. It's a little bit complicated on the right side, but basically it is the way the cell copes with hypoxia or low oxygen. And so this hypoxia inducible factor, these HIF proteins are the star of the hypoxia response. Um, and this is what the Nobel Prize was awarded for uh, about a year ago. And what happens is when organisms uh, enter an atmosphere where there's low oxygen, uh, these proteins enter the nucleus of the cell and turn on hundreds of genes that allow the animal to cope with low oxygen. And this involves a very elaborate rewiring of metabolism. On the other hand, when you have oxygen in the atmosphere, these proteins are degraded. And so for this purpose, all we need to know is that tricking the organism into thinking it is in hypoxia enables it to survive in this cell cellular setting. I mean, at first, this is, was very confusing, right? We think about hypoxia or low oxygen as being a bad thing, right? We need oxygen to breathe, to survive. So why is it that having low oxygen could be potentially protective? Um, and so we decided to keep pushing the envelope and continuing with this, this concept. As I mentioned, this was all done in isolated cells, but of course we wanted to develop a therapy. And so we wanted to go directly into um, animal models of disease. And so this is an MRI of a mouse um, that has a mitochondrial uh, dysfunction. And so it's a model that we use to understand mitochondrial disease. And on the right side here is an equivalent MRI of a human patient with this really severe mitochondrial disease that I had mentioned. And both the humans and the mice have these, these bright lesions um, in the regions of the, of the brain that control things like uh, breathing um, and balance. And so both the mice and the humans have very similar presentations. Um, the animals, for example, suffer from body weight loss, their body temperature drops, they're blind, they're deaf, they have locomotor defects. And ultimately, because of these lesions, these white dots in the brain, um, because of these lesions, these animals die of respiratory failure, um, similar to the human patients. And this typically happens within the first few years of life in humans. And in this mouse model of disease, it happens at about two months of age. So very striking um, sort of symptoms that lead to death at a very early age. Um, and so, as I mentioned, based on our CRISPR cellular work, we had found that activating the hypoxia or low oxygen response was potentially protective in states of mitochondrial dysfunction. And so I was really eager to test this concept in this mouse model of disease. And we actually had a drug available that activated this response. And so I remember during my training, spending a lot of time trying to get this drug into the brains of these animals. So this this drug need, needed to cross the blood-brain barrier to enter the, the regions of the brain that were affected in this disease. And I was trying and trying and trying, and so sometime in graduate school, um, and it wasn't working, and I was very, very frustrated. And then I took a step back and asked, wait a minute, what is the best way to activate a hypoxia response, right? What is the best way naturally to trigger this response? And then we thought, okay, it sounds like probably hypoxia itself would be the best way to do this. Um, and you know, it seemed like a strange concept. Again, hypoxia is considered usually a bad thing, but we thought, why don't we just see what happens if we put this mitochondrial disease model in a low oxygen environment? And this was really the aha moment in this project. 
Um, and I think just to show you what happened, I will just show you directly a video of this finding. And so these are five animals that all have this mitochondrial disease. They're all siblings. Three of them have lived at sea level, um, equivalent to uh, San Francisco or Boston, 21% oxygen. And two of them have lived in the mountains of Peru and Nepal. So that's about 5,000 meters altitude, which is about 10% oxygen. So about half the amount of oxygen that we breathe at sea level, um, but a level is actually fairly benign to humans. Um, so there's entire cities that exist at this altitude. And so again, all five of these mice, you know, genetically have the disease, but three of them, and you can probably guess which ones, the ones in the middle, um, have lived at sort of San Francisco, Boston levels of oxygen, while the other two have lived in the mountains of Peru and Nepal. And it's this really striking um, response where simply lowering the oxygen levels um, in this situation was protective. Um, and of course, you know, there are limits to this. If you lower the oxygen too much, then every animal dies. And so you have to be very, very careful when applying this, this therapy. And so um, this was our initial results. And so this is a survival curve of these animals. And so on the Y axis here is the percentage of animals that are alive. And you can see here that at sea level or 21% oxygen, all of the mitochondrial disease animals uh, uh, die by the age of about 60 to 70 days of age. So about two months of age, the sea level mice are no longer alive. On the other hand, if we put these animals in 10% oxygen, equivalent to Peru and Nepal, they were all alive um, at the time that the study was first published, and it turns out they lived to about one year of age. And so simply turning the oxygen dial to low had this completely magical effect on mitochondrial disease and led to this five-fold extension and lifespan of these animals. Um, and so this is truly remarkable. It gave us hope that there might be a way to treat this devastating disorder. And we could really rescue almost every aspect of disease that we tested. And so here on the Y axis is the body weight of the mice. And so the red dots here are the diseased mice living at room air, 21% oxygen. And you can see they start to lose weight and they die by about two months of age. On the other hand, if we place these animals in hypoxia in blue, they continue to gain weight and do relatively um, okay and almost equivalent to animals that don't have the genetic disorder. We can look at body temperature. And so in black are sort of the healthy mice and in red is the body temperature of mice that are living at sea level and have this disease. And in blue is the body temperature of mice that have been living in hypoxia. And so again, body temperature is completely rescued um, with this exposure to hypoxia. Um, we can also measure their ability to stay on a rotating rod, and that's a reflection of how, how, um, how well they can sort of exercise um, and their muscle strength. And the, the larger the number, the better the animal does. And so in red here, uh, the diseased mice, the knockouts relative to the wild type animals um, are not able to stay on this rotating rod. And then with hypoxia, they actually do relatively okay. So again, every aspect of disease was really being rescued in this setting. And then that brought us to a very important question from a clinical perspective, which is, can we reverse the disease in addition to preventing it? So of course, it's great to be able to prevent a disease, but oftentimes these genetic disorders are first diagnosed after the patient has already had a metabolic crisis and is already fairly sick. And so we wanted to know if it was possible to actually reverse the disorder. And this was really, really cool. Um, so here I'll show you again, the Y axis is the body weight of the animals. And um, in room air, uh, the diseased mice in yellow lose weight and die. If we start the hypoxia or low oxygen exposure at a very early age, these mice before the disease, they gain weight and they live. And now we can do something interesting. We can wait until the animals have started to lose weight and are starting to get sick. We can turn the oxygen dial to low and the disease trajectory is completely reversed. And so even within about 48 hours, the animals start to do much, much better um, with hypoxia exposure, suggesting that we can actually reverse the disorder in addition to preventing it. And this is really sort of the clutch experiment 
Um, so these are the brains of the animals um, that have the disease. And again, these two white dots um, represent this disease condition. And so we can wait until the animals have developed these lesions. We can turn the oxygen dial to low and the lesions disappear in the matter of a few weeks. And we can actually accelerate this process. And so if we give extreme hypoxia within a week, the lesions have disappeared. Um, and so of course, you know, this is with caution, this is still very early stage animal work. Um, and so not that we should be doing this in humans yet, but we have some promise um, that this type of an approach could potentially work someday in the future. Um, okay, so I just told you that low oxygen had this magical effect on mitochondrial disease and dysfunction. Um, and so you can actually make your house hypoxic for several thousand dollars. You can actually buy machines that the um, athletes use to train um, to make your house hypoxic. But, you know, ideally we could develop a gas-free therapy for mitochondrial disease. So perhaps a more practical approach for patients that have mitochondrial disease. Um, and so this is uh, an equation essentially that tells you how the amount of oxygen in the body is controlled. And so the, the main variables here are the amount of oxygen that's delivered to the body and the amount of oxygen that's consumed. And so you can play a lot of different tricks with the body to change the amount of oxygen that a given tissue like the brain is seeing at any given time. Um, and so these are not approaches that will ever turn into therapies, but as a proof of concept, we can change the oxygen levels in the tissues using multiple ways to cure the disease. Um, again, you know, not to be tried at home, but low dose, very low dose carbon monoxide actually causes hypoxia. And so here is a survival curve with the diseased mice that are not being treated in black. If we give very low dose carbon monoxide, it extends life by about two to three fold. And this is by causing tissue hypoxia. We can also do essentially bloodletting um, or anemia. And this also decreases the amount of oxygen in the animal's body. And that also has this remarkable extension of lifespan in red relative to untreated mice in black. Um, and again, these are all just proofs of concept that you can change the amount of oxygen that's being delivered to the body using multiple mechanisms and use this as a therapeutic um, strategy. And so again, none of these will be the actual solution, but it gives us an idea about the types of tricks we can play in the body um, to have a therapeutic uh, approach. And it turns out that the final you know, version of this will actually probably be a drug that affects how tightly red blood cells hold onto oxygen. And so we can change the tightness with which the red blood cells hold onto oxygen as a way to decrease the amount of oxygen that's reaching different tissues. Um, and such a drug, for example, is already being developed for sickle cell anemia. And so we can potentially repurpose such a drug for mitochondrial dysfunction. And actually based on this early work, we started a phase one clinical trials. Um, this has happened in Boston, and this is just taking uh, healthy humans and exposing them to hypoxia over the course of a week and making sure that this can be done in a very controlled setting in a hospital. And, you know, of course, that works because people have been climbing mountains for quite some time. Um, but it has to be said that this needs to be done very, very cautiously in a controlled setting um, because, of course, too little oxygen can be very, very catastrophic as well. Um, so there's sort of a fine balance to be found um, in the body. Okay, so we have this, this potentially, um, you know, magical solution to curing mitochondrial dysfunction, um, but how is this working, right? We, we came to this sort of through this unbiased approach where we didn't really understand the actual pathways that were being involved. And so now my lab is really trying to understand what is the mechanism of the rescue? Why is hypoxia working? Um, and the first clue came when we did a very, very simple experiment. So earlier I told you that these diseased mice in room air die at about two months of age with this red line. With hypoxia, they lived to about a year, so five-fold extension in lifespan. So what happens if we do something very simple, if we turn the oxygen dial just a little bit in the other direction? So very mild hyperoxia, which means high oxygen. And if we do this starting at a very young age, it's catastrophic. And so the animals die within a few days of hyperoxia exposure. So this is really, really dramatic, you know, uh, to have this type of an effect within a matter of, of two to three days. 
just by you giving mild hyperoxia. And this is a level that's actually completely benign to wild type or healthy animals, suggesting that mitochondrial disorders are particularly susceptible to hyperoxia. And so this actually has very clear biomedical relevance. And that is that for patients that have mitochondrial disease, perhaps we should be careful about giving them supplemental oxygen. And in certain cases, it might be actually very important to, the, to the, the patients for them to survive. But unless it's clearly indicated, we suggest that perhaps we should be cautious about supplemental oxygen for states of mitochondrial dysfunction. And actually, you know, when we first came out, came out with the story, we had several clinicians reach out to us and say, oh, you know, I actually had a mitochondrial disease patient. We gave them excess oxygen thinking, oh, oxygen's a good thing. And more oxygen should mean better mitochondria. And both of those case, cases, the patients actually became comatose within 24 to 48 hours, suggesting that oxygen might actually be toxic to mitochondrial um, disorders. Um, then we asked, you know, what is going wrong at these different oxygen tensions? So in sea level air, the main disease occurs in the brain. It's basically a neurological disorder. But what's happening in high or low oxygen? What are the animals dying of? And so as I mentioned, in normoxia or sea level air, these mice develop these neurological lesions, these two white dots. Um, but in hypoxia, low oxygen, or hyperoxia, high oxygen, these lesions were actually not there, right? So it seemed like the animals were dying of something else, perhaps some other tissue was being affected. And what we noticed was that in hypoxia, even though they lived much, much longer, so almost a year of age, um, they actually, they sort of dropped dead all of a sudden. So at about a year, these animals would just um, sort of drop dead. And that made us think that perhaps this is a cardiac phenotype, something heart related was going wrong. And so these are echocardiograms of mice, uh, wild type being healthy mice or diseased mice, which are the knockout mice exposed to hypoxia. So you can see the heart beating and you can see that it's not beating as well um, in the diseased mice exposed to hypoxia. So we think that in the very long run, you know, we've extended life by about fivefold in these mice with hypoxia, but ultimately we think they die of heart failure in hypoxia. Interestingly, in high oxygen, we think it's something very different that's happening. And so these are images of the lung. And so you can see here, these are the air spaces in the lung. Um, and in healthy mice, there's, there's you know, a decent amount of space there. And in these mitochondrial disease mice exposed to high oxygen, the lungs get invaded with this immune response, so pulmonary edema. Um, and so we think that in hyperoxia, the mice are actually dying of a lung disease. And so this is absolutely fascinating, right? Three different organ systems, three different tissues are failing at three different oxygen tensions. And so there's something really, really important about making sure that each organ sees just the right, right amount of oxygen to survive. Um, I'm going to skip this for a second. Um, so then we decided to ask, you know, Oxygen clearly seems to be toxic to these animals. So what is happening to oxygen in these mice? How much oxygen are they actually consuming? And it turns out the mitochondria consume about 90% of the oxygen in the body. So they're the primary oxygen consumers or essentially oxygen detoxifiers in the body. And so here on the y-axis, we can measure the amount of oxygen that animals are breathing. And on the x-axis is age. And so healthy animals or wild type animals in black, you know, have a relatively constant amount of oxygen that they're consuming. Whereas the mitochondrial disease mice in red have a increasingly lower amount of oxygen consumption. And so as their mitochondria stop working, they start consuming less and less oxygen at the whole animal level. And so that's fascinating, right? Uh, when oxygen demand goes down, but we haven't done anything yet to oxygen supply, right? So what do we think is happening to the oxygen in the tissues itself? And so we decided to measure the partial pressure of oxygen or the oxygen levels um, in the brains of, of these mice. Um, and what we found was really interesting. So here on the x-axis is the amount of oxygen that the animal is breathing. And so let's focus here, uh, point two refers to sea level, 21% oxygen. And on the y-axis is the level of oxygen in the brains of these mice. So in wild type or healthy mice, they have this amount of oxygen. 
But then in the mitochondrial diseased mice, because they are no longer consuming oxygen, they now have double the amount of oxygen in the brains of these animals. So this, this disease is in fact, maybe not just a disease of energy failure, as people typically think about when they think about mitochondria, but perhaps this is one of the first diseases of excess oxygen, a disease of so-called hyperoxia. And when we ask these animals to breathe low oxygen, so 10% oxygen, we perhaps take this high oxygen in the brain and bring it back down to normal levels. And so the way we picture this is that if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, perhaps you have these pockets of high oxygen in the brains of these animals and perhaps patients that have mitochondrial dysfunction, whether it's mitochondrial disease, perhaps Parkinson's disease or aging. And these pockets of high oxygen are actually toxic. It's by breathing low oxygen, perhaps that brings them back down to normal levels and enables survival. Um, and so, you know, this is really interesting for mitochondrial disease, but will this work for other disease conditions? And so suffice it to say that we identified about 75 other genetic disorders that we think might benefit from low oxygen therapy. Um, and some of these include genes that are involved in a range of age associated conditions. Um, and so we're working hard to tackle some of these questions. What types of disorders beyond mitochondrial disease can be rescued by low oxygen? And especially things like age associated neurodegeneration and perhaps the aging process itself. Um, and I won't talk about this much today, but we also think there are genes that are on the other side of the spectrum that might be rescued by high oxygen related to a completely different part of the cell called the peroxisome. So not, not much about that today. Um, and so there's really a lot of exciting uh, science to be done here, a lot of interesting biomedically relevant avenues. Um, as I told you, hypoxia extends life of mitochondrial disease models by about fivefold. Um, and not only does it prevent disease, it actually reverses the neurological lesions. So imagine if we could do this for more common conditions and age-associated conditions. And as a snippet, I'll mention that actually um, humans tend to live longer at high altitudes um, and lower organisms like worms and flies um, actually have a longer lifespans in hypoxia. And so, you know, a lot of this is sort of early work, but we hope to see if hypoxia can perhaps um, increase lifespan and prevent aging. Let's skip that for now. Um, we think that we've identified one of the first diseases of excess oxygen where brain PO2 or oxygen levels are elevated. And so this is a case where too much oxygen is actually toxic. And now we're trying to figure out why that might be the case. Why is too much oxygen a bad thing? Um, not only hypoxia, but we can actually develop creative ways to decrease the amount of oxygen in these disease conditions. And ultimately, we think there might be small molecules that enable us to do this more practically. And we think that this is really just the tip of the iceberg. We think that there's many other genetic conditions that might benefit from low oxygen environments. Um, and so we're excited to now test this in more common conditions and age associated conditions. Um, and of course, this will first have to be done in mouse models of disease before it can be uh, applied to any human patients. So still, still a while to go, but we think there's a bright future ahead. Um, so now in the time that remains, maybe in the next 10 minutes or so, I'll give you a glimpse about the other direction in the lab. So I just told you that simply changing the amount of oxygen that we breathe can have this remarkable therapeutic effect. Um, and so now what else can we change about the way we live to use this as a way to develop treatments for um, metabolic disorders? And so this is the part of the lab that I call turning the vitamin dial. Um, and this is really a, a sort of underappreciated field scientifically, and I'll tell you why, um, but we think that changing the amount of vitamins in your diet could also have remarkable therapeutic effect. And I say this a little bit tongue in cheek, but um, you know, 1890s to 1950s, uh, this is true. This is like an absolutely beautiful era of biochemistry. This is when vitamins were first discovered. And so first of all, what is a vitamin? A vitamin is something that's needed by the human body, but we can't make it within our body. And so it needs to be taken from the diet. Uh, right now there's 13 vitamins um, that are, are defined as such. Um, and they were discovered again from 1890s to 1950s. Uh, there was over a dozen Nobel prizes given. They were the so-called vitamin hunters. 
Um, and these, these individuals, these scientists, discovered these vitamins in very creative ways. They would notice that the sort of population of, of cows or pigs all of a sudden became sick, and they'd ask, why is this the case? And then they'd figure out that something had changed in the animal's diet that had led to this really devastating um, sort of change in their survival. And then they would go and isolate the exact compound that was responsible for this effect. And in, in such manners, um, the 13 vitamins were discovered. And so not only are vitamins things that we eat from our diet, turns out they're actually cofactors for proteins or enzymes. So for proteins or enzymes to function, they, they require vitamin cofactors. And so again, a lot of work was done in the early 1900s to figure out what each vitamin does in the body. And then something happened, and this is, you know, I'm saying this sort of jokingly, but uh, from 1950s to, uh, to about present day, uh, we entered what I call the whole foods era of supplements, where it became somewhat of a fad to sort of ad hoc take different vitamins at very high doses without clear rationale for why we were doing this. Um, and in the last, I would say, 50, 60 years, there's been sort of a lack of rigorous scientific research to understand which diseases might benefit from high or low doses of a given vitamin. But there's huge potential for this concept. And so there's many case reports um, where high doses of a vitamin have really had a dramatic impact on a patient. Um, and indeed, there's over 5,000 clinical trials with different vitamins. Um, but the thing is, oftentimes these clinical trials start um, in a sort of random manner. So some clinician somewhere will notice, oh, I had a patient who had headaches or migraines and they took vitamin, whatever, B, B6, and they did better. So let's try that as a clinical trial. So we wanted to tackle this question much more rigorously. Can we very systematically go in and answer which genetic disorders or which metabolic disorders could benefit from supplementation of a specific vitamin? And so can we add some sort of scientific rationale for these types of clinical trials? And so the big, que the big questions that we're asking is how does a vitamin get into the cell? How does the body sense the vitamin levels? How does it activate the vitamin? Um, what are all of the proteins that depend on a given vitamin? And the reason this is important is because you can have disorders in all of these different steps. So we can understand how vitamins are transported, we can understand which genetic disorders might cause low levels of vitamin in the body, even if the individual is eating enough amounts of the vitamin. And so for example, these patients might benefit from very high doses of a given vitamin. And we think this is relevant across a range of different conditions. So there might be many metabolic conditions out there that could benefit from vitamin supplementation um, in a very systematic manner. Um, it's also very important for development. And so as you might uh, recall, uh, vitamin B9 or folate is absolutely essential during pregnancy. And this is true for a lot of different vitamins. So how do variations in vitamin levels affect human development um, and lead to problems with childhood uh, developmental disorders? And then it's also known that a lot of vitamins can, can interact with common drugs that we take. And so can we understand drug vitamin interactions to say, if we're taking a drug that interferes with vitamin metabolism, perhaps you should supplement your diet with that given vitamin. Um, and so again, these are all sort of simple interventions um, that can really have, we think, profound biomedical impact. And so I'll stop here. This is our growing lab. Um, we've been at UCSF and the Gladstone Institutes for about the last two years. And so a lot of exciting science to be done. And we're uh, really looking forward to understanding what happens when you turn the oxygen and the vitamin dials. Um, and so hopefully more to come in the coming years. And so I will stop here and take some questions. Thank you so much, Isha. Um, that was amazing. I think we already have a lot of questions already coming in and audience members feel free to use the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen to ask those questions and we'll just start going through them. So I'll start at the top here. We have a question from Arthur that says, what is known about relation of oxygen levels to COVID long hauler symptoms? No, these are great questions. You know, oxygen comes up so much during COVID. You know, obviously it's a respiratory uh, disorder and hypoxia in that case is actually very, very bad. Um, you know, actually not a lot is known about the relationship um, between sort of long COVID and hypoxia. So I think something definitely worth investigating in the future. Um, 
Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, definitely a hot topic right now. <laughs> Um, another question from Don says, please discuss HBOT, HBOT for traumatic brain injury. Yeah, um, you know, we haven't directly worked on traumatic brain injury TBI. I know there is significant evidence out there that HBOT, which is hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy, so high pressure, high oxygen therapy, um, might help for those conditions. Um, you know, we haven't directly worked on it, so I can't say directly um, if that's true or not. Um, you know, I think part of these types of associations are really just based on um, sort of the intuition that oxygen should be a good thing. Um, and in cases where the tissue itself is very hypoxic, which might be the case for traumatic brain injury, you know, it might make sense to give high oxygen for brief periods of time. But even in those cases, you know, living in high oxygen is probably not ideal. That, that's my gut reaction. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, another question here says, can meditation help us with our oxygen levels? If yes, how? And then are certain types of meditation that are best to practice? I love that question. Uh, I think, you know, people tell me I should learn to meditate more and to, to control of breathing patterns. Um, uh, you know, I, I think meditation and equivalent exercises definitely regulate respiratory rate and the amount of oxygen that you're intaking. Um, my intuition is that for the types of diseases that we're studying, it's really about the chronic oxygen levels. And so things like meditation might affect the amount of oxygen in your tissues for those brief periods of time. Um, but I think the things that we're thinking about are sort of chronic. And so I'm not sure if that short burst of hypoxia would, uh, would be helpful. Great, thank you. Um, another question says, what is the relationship between mitochondria and telomeres? Ah, uh, uh, you know, I don't know about the direct relationship, but they're both considered hallmarks of aging. And so as you age, telomeres become shorter and mitochondrial dysfunction increases. Um, and so there's definitely a connection that they're both age associated uh, conditions per se. Um, yeah, I don't know how much is known about the causality there, whether mitochondrial dysfunction is enough to cause changes in telomere length or vice versa. Interesting. Thank you. Um, got another question here that says oxygen percent doesn't change with altitude. Why not try normal atmospheric pressure with higher concentration of N2? Yeah, so you, you caught you caught the, the punchline there. So we actually that's actually what we do. So we don't actually simulate high altitude per se. You could do that, which is hypobaric hypoxia, low oxygen, low pressure. But in a lab setting, it's actually much easier to just change the amount of nitrogen and dilute out the oxygen as, as uh, you're asking. And so that's, that's exactly what we do. Um, and as, as of now, most people think that there's not that much of a difference between hypobaric hypoxia and normobaric hypoxia um, for most physiological parameters. Great. Thank you. Um, another one says, are lower oxygen levels a valid treatment for Parkinson's patients as well as those with Lee syndrome? Yeah, you know, those are the types of questions that we're sort of actively investigating right now. So I would say more to come in the next, you know, one or two years. So uh, we, we think that this will work for additional conditions. But before I say too much, I think we'll have to just wait and see and let the, let the science guide us. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely still in the early stages. So you got to ensure all of it still works and everything as it goes through. Um, another question from Jim says, do humans and animals that are acclimated to very high altitudes suffer mitochondrial disease if moved to sea level? Oh, that's a great question. You know, people ask us this sort of a related question, which is what is the incidence of mitochondrial disease at high altitude? Maybe people do better. And so there's higher incidence of mitochondrial disease. Um, you know, the, the incidence is low enough and the populations in the medical care at these high altitudes is not sufficient to have good records of these things. There are one or two papers suggesting that a vari variants in the mitochondrial DNA are increased at high altitude, suggesting a similar concept that um, high altitude protects against mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, and so that, that's an association. And like I said, you know, um, people tend to live longer in high altitudes and other sort of metabolic conditions seem to go down at high altitude. Um, but, you know, in theory, that could be for, for other reasons. Like maybe people in Denver are just healthier, which they probably are. <laughs> so I think a lot of these things need to be tested experimentally in the lab to know for sure. No, absolutely. That makes sense. Um, another question here says, is sleeping in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber a bad idea for someone without mitochondria disease? 
Oh, uh, you know, I think I feel like this is not a fair answer, but I think it's again too early to tell. Um, I think, you know, for people that have specific reasons to be sleeping in hyperbaric hyperoxia, maybe sleep apnea or other sort of conditions, you know, in those situations, it might make sense. But I think if you're just like a healthy human, um, then at least if it were me, I would probably not sleep in a hyperbaric chamber um, just like that. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, we have another question here from Dawn that says, please discuss human genetic variation in oxidative stress management and how this interplays with hypoxia as a potential therapy for ranges of mitochondria disease. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't know how much has been done about sort of natural genetic variations in oxidative stress pathways. Um, one question I often get asked is, do antioxidants work for mitochondrial disease, which might be sort of a related question. Um, and they actually have not been shown to work reproducibly for mitochondrial disease or for really age associated conditions necessarily, at least, you know, jury's still out. And um, there's a, a scientist at the Buck Institute that um, told me this analogy that I really like, which is if you have oxidative stress and say that's a glass of red wine, um, hypoxia is the equivalent of not spilling the red wine, right? You prevent the reactive oxygen species from even forming because you don't have oxygen. And antioxidants are like spilling the red wine and then trying to clean it up, right? And so that's sort of one analogy, which is maybe you just prevent the formation of oxidative stress rather than trying to mop it up. And so we like to think that maybe hypoxia is sort of the best antioxidant or best oxidative stress solution. Um, so yeah, I guess that doesn't directly answer that question, but uh, that's my thoughts on oxidative stress and hypoxia. No, no, that's great. I love the wine, um, Senator. What's the word? Um, analogy. Sorry. Yeah, this is Martin Brand's analogy from the book. Yeah. Um, all right. Another question from Beth it says, what is an example of a low oxygen therapy? Um, yeah. So, you know, in general, low oxygen is not used as a therapeutic. And so this is sort of what our work first brought up was the idea that low oxygen could be protective. And so in general, I don't think this concept has really been out there. Um, I think people are starting to appreciate it more and more in recent days that you shouldn't just ad hoc give supplemental oxygen to all patients for no reason. You know, of course, if you have COVID or really significant respiratory issues, then it's absolutely essential. Um, but I think just now is when we're starting to pitch the idea that low oxygen could be protective. So I actually can't think of that many or any examples where that's already the case. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's funny, my dad has been telling me about how he's trying to use nasal breathing when he works out and exercises because he thinks or he's been reading a book about how, you know, treat telling your body how to react and, and work out without like all of that, you know, like that helps, you know, and that's he's been telling me that. So it's very interesting hearing this, all these answers and all this stuff about low oxygen, and how it can actually be beneficial. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, another question here says, would sustained exposure to hypoxia improve survival rates for diseases involving an acute lack of oxygen, such as stroke or heart attack, mm -hmm. if these patients, this is in parentheses, if these patients are somewhat adapted to lower levels of oxygen already, perhaps this would give them a bit more time to survive treatment? That's an absolutely brilliant question. Yeah, these are the types of things that we're asking. So there's a concept called ischemia reperfusion injury. And so that's a situation in which you have a stroke or a heart attack where your blood vessel is occluded. And so there's not enough oxygen to be delivered. And you're exactly right. In that situation, the tissue might adapt to low oxygen. And then you might go into the ER and get an angioplasty or somehow get that clot removed. And there's a sudden burst of oxygen and we call that reperfusion injury. And it's thought that that sudden burst of oxygen is actually detrimental. And so that could very well be the case that perhaps after or during that reperfusion phase, perhaps it would make sense to lower the oxygen levels at least briefly. And so, yeah, we're, we're trying all of those types of experiments um, as we speak. Yeah, That's amazing. great question. Um, Another question here says, please discuss controlling variations in CO2 levels uh, via the cellular hypoxia. hypoxia. Sorry, I was trying to read the question there. Yeah, you know, to be honest, we haven't looked that much at CO2 uh, variations and their effects on these types of conditions. I um, mean, you know, I think probably analogous genetic screens should be done where you vary CO2 levels. Um, yeah, so I think we don't actually know the answer to that yet. Great. Um, coming up on here on a couple last questions. Um, one says, uh, 
how to form slash create a hypoxia environment living in the Bay Area to see if- Oh no, <laughs> I definitely don't advocate doing that just yet. I think we need to, we need to do more research before uh, telling people to, to do this at home. Um, so I'm just gonna say, don't do this at home right now. <laughs> don't um, try this at home, disclaimer. Yeah, definitely don't try this at home. <laughs> Bad things could happen. Okay. Um, have a funny one here kind of related to one we asked earlier but it says should people with parkinson's move to denver <laughs> yeah you know i think again you know we're still sort of at these preclinical early stages and so i think first we have to do the mouse studies then the sort of higher animal studies then the clinical trials so i think you know hopefully we'll have some clearer answers in the next uh, you know five to ten years that's awesome um, and I think we're, this is the last question before we, we sign off here. It says many people who live in high altitudes move to lower elevations when they get older because they have trouble getting enough oxygen. For example, those who live in Mexico city or Denver, how does that coordinate with this information? Yeah. You know, I, I also haven't looked at that that much. I think people that for generations have lived in high altitudes tend to be okay. Um, but yeah, I think if you have respiratory issues for some other reason, like COPD, for example, um, then low oxygen could be problematic. Um, I think for just a healthy individual living at moderate hypoxia, it should be okay. Um, All right. Um, I think then we'll wrap up here a little bit early, but thank you all for joining tonight. Uh, this was another fantastic edition of Virtual Cafe Sci, and thank you, Isha, so much for taking the time to Absolutely. speak with us. Uh, it was fascinating. I know for me personally, like I said, my dad's been talking to me about how to like nasal breathe while I'm exercising. It's supposed to be super helpful. So this is just so matter of fact that you were talking about this tonight on Cafe Eye. Okay. And I know based on all these questions, our attendees found it fascinating as well. Um, audience members, our next Cafe Sci will be coming up in April. So be on the lookout for that in a and a registration link in the follow-up email. And with that, I think I'll let you guys all enjoy the rest of your Thursday evening. So I look forward to seeing you all next month at our next Cafe Sci. Thank you all.